Hey everybody, this is Leroy from Leroy Gaming, and in today's Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader video, we're going to go ahead and talk about the convictions system in Rogue Trader, which basically, if you're trying to compare it to like a D&D &D system, this is a belief slash alignment system of sorts, but it works a little bit differently. Uh, so I wanted to go over that. I'm going to talk to you about what it impacts, why it's important, what the benefits are for going down any given path, so that if you are just getting ready to play this game, you can plan ahead and not be surprised uh, by any given pathway. So this game does, in a nutshell, give you technically three distinct ways to play if you really wanted to min-max any one direction. But in a way, you can... Play in such a way that you're a bit of a mix of the different directions. And I'll explain exactly what that means within this video. So, again, if you end up finding this video helpful, make sure to drop a like. Subscribe if you want to see more RPG content, including Rogue Trader content from me. And if you want to help get this video in front of other people, dropping comments below for questions or feedback is very, very helpful with the algorithm. Now let's go ahead and talk about the conviction system. Basically, this has been renamed a few times, but in the release, you basically have dogmatic, heretical, and iconoclast. So dogmatic is kind of the imperial pathway. It's generally good, you could think so, but it's kind of like an authoritarian path playthrough. Uh, you're playing where you are all about protecting humanity and the emp emperor, and you're kind of racist to be honest with you um they're anti-xenos and xenos is anything that's alien and the whole idea of down this pathway if you make choices in the game that are dogmatic in nature you're gonna be anti-aliens anti obviously the void and and demonic creatures and pro-humanity which sometimes will be very positive and kind of a good guy role but sometimes you may end up making some questionable decisions uh, for the good of mankind, quote-unquote. The second pathway is the iconoclast. And this is kind of, if you're talking about alignment, I would say chaotic good. Um, you're all about freedom, um, helping people, sacrificing for the greater good. And this pathway is also very Xenos-friendly uh, compared to the other pathways. So you're okay with human life, obviously not okay with demons, but this is uh, the most goody two-shoe of the three playthroughs if you make decisions down this path. And then you have heretical, which is definitely the chaotic evil methodology. You can feed into the corruption. You can, uh, like I am doing on this playthrough, be pretty messed up. Uh, and this game is very, very dark. So we're talking about sacrificing people, torturing people, uh, heretical actions. You know, if somebody pisses your main character off. You may just execute them on the spot or make them suffer as much as possible. So it's very, very, very dark. Now, first thing I want to point out is what making these choices impact. So you are going to have sometimes small decisions, sometimes giant decisions that impact colonies, worlds, etc. That can be everything from dogmatic, heretical, and iconoclast. And whenever a decision will impact, and give you points towards the direction as you see here like i'm 30 out of 75 towards point two in dogmatic but i'm 203 out of 300 towards uh phase four of heretical it will in parentheses say this is a dogmatic decision this is like an iconoclast decision and so forth and then if you decide to make that choice you're going to get anywhere between one four six or more points uh in that direction now the main things that this will impact is story-wise from my experience playing numerous standpoints, um, the main arcs of the or story, at least for the first two acts, still head in the same direction. You're not going to have a completely different experience. But what happens to certain populations, certain NPCs, will change. There are also pieces of equipment that require you to have a certain amount of progress towards dogmatic, iconoclast, or heretical. Otherwise, you cannot wear them. Or they may have additional benefits if you are of that conviction. The next thing uh, that I want to point out is there are major 
decisions when it comes to colonies and definitely watch my colony video that's going to be coming out to learn more about this but you can impact how you manage your colonies and some of those decisions are very heretical or maybe very dogmatic and there's going to be different benefits you're going to get depending on what you choose and they are always mutually exclusive so you either pick one or the other so it allows you to shape how you rule your expanse your your region of the galaxy here uh, depending on what you choose and then finally the other thing that this is going to impact is that as you hit these different tiers you're going to get different buffs and i will go over them right now now as of 1.0 release my opinion is iconoclast probably has the best quote unquote buffs but you can let me know what your thoughts are so let's go ahead and take a look what the buffs are so we're going to go ahead and start with dogmatic pathway and tier one, once you get tier one, you get Grim Determination. Rogue Trader and their allies gain a 10% chance to survive one wound instead of falling unconscious. If you get to tier two, you're gonna get Absolution, as you see here. In the first round of combat, all critical hits scored by the Rogue Trader's party inflict burning. And then all fire damage suffered by enemies is increased by plus one for each conviction dogmatic rank. And this explains down below there, as you can see, what burning means. And so it's plus one damage, and notice you can have up to five ranks, so that can be up to five points. Next, level three is Path of Redemption. Any momentum expenditure by the rogue trader and their allies, including heroic actions, is reduced by minus 20. So again, I'll do a different video on this, but momentum, in short, is basically you, you build up this meter, and you can, if it gets high enough, you can use superpowers, basically heroic acts, as they say here, um, to really dramatically impact the flow of any battle. And this makes it that when you spend those points uh, to use those powers, for example, that it's not going to drop as far so you can get back to max score again uh, much quicker. So that's actually quite good. Then on four, you have piercing resolution. Once per battle, the rogue trader may choose an ally including themselves for one round all the targets weapon attacks ignore enemies armor that can be quite powerful but again uh, it's only for one round so depending on what kind of weapon you use uh and whether you can use a heroic act during that time or not uh that could be quite powerful and then level five here instrument of those will until the start of their next turn the rogue traders becomes immune to any attacks from demons xenos and all demons and xenos in a five foot radius Consider them a priority target. Can we only be used once per battle? So this is like a giant AoE taunt. And then any attacks from those kind of creatures will do no damage. So that's dogmatic. Now, if you go down heretical, the polar opposite, tier one is resource preservation. Uh, rogue trader and allies gain 20% chance to save combat stimulants or med kits after use. It's a one in five chance to save um these resources now if you're playing on normal difficulty or lower you may not even be using those quite as much but on higher difficulties where things hit a lot harder and you're going to be using more resources to min max this could be potentially helpful tier two is destroyed a week for the first round of combat everyone rogues traders party gains 25 percent chance to gain one action point after killing an enemy however triggering this effect immediately manifests psychotic phenomenon does not reset the cooldown of attacks and abilities. So if you don't understand what psychotic phenomena are, I again will be doing um, a video on basic psych attacks, but this is what you need to know. When you use a lot of psychic abilities, it fills up a specific bar, and when it gets high enough, bad things can happen. So you could just t take random damage, you could summon a demon that attacks you, and you have to deal with uh, and various other effects. Now, if you go heretical, you actually have feats that you can take where you're going to get positive benefits when you proc these psychic phenomena. So they're not always bad if you build your characters to benefit from psychic phenomena. So this is very situational again. If, for example, you play heretical, but for some reason don't pick the right feats, this could be all bad. But again, if you build correctly, this ability could be quite useful. Uh, for proccing more psychic phenomena uh, more quickly and hence potentially giving you more benefits. Level three is Gift of the Warp. 
So any psychic phenomenon, again, increases the momentum of the rogue trader party by 2 to 10 instead of decreasing by 1 to 5. So again, traditionally, if you're a good guy, when psychic phenomena happens, momentum, you can think of it like morale in battle, drops. But here, because you're heretical and you're like on the side of the void pretty much, when this stuff happens, all of a sudden your momentum goes up dramatically more, and so you're able to use more of your heroic powers and so forth. So again, really leans into using more psychic powers um, and having these proc and, you know, taking a risk of possibly bad things happening to you, but at the benefit of having positive side effects as well. Level four is going to be uh, demon, uh, demon pathy. Uh, once per battle, rogue trader may choose an ally, including themselves, and grant them plus 20 bonus to all their characteristics for two rounds. But after the effect fades, the target falls prone. So you can get a nice boost to stats, but the falling prone is pretty rough. Here's what you need to know about falling prone. When you fall prone, you have to waste the whole round to get up. That's pretty brutal. It's not like D&D &D where you lose half your movement, you can still act. When you have to get up in this game, you are quite literally missing a turn. Pretty rough. So there's a big negative to that side. And at number five, power from beyond the veil. All weapons on a battlefield become warp imbued for one round, gaining bonus damage equal to plus veil degradation level and additional plus five times veil degradation percent of armor piercing can only be used once per combat. Do notice, uh, I haven't tested this out yet, but it says all weapons. So this could also backfire uh, and because it's powering up enemy weapons as well. Veil degradation is basically that score I mentioned, that bar as you use more psychic powers. The higher that gets, the more likely those psychic events are to happen. So again, the more psychic energy, the more chaos energy is in the battlefield, the bigger a buff you're going to get from this power. And then finally, we have um, the Iconoclast Pathway. So Tier 1, above the Thundering Gods, the Rogue Trader, and two random allies start combat with temporary wounds equal to their own resolve. Resolve, uh, again, as a quick note, is how much of that momentum you get just for starting your turn for each character. They have unique resolve stat. Some will have more than others, and there's feats you can take to improve that. So depending on what kind of build you have, if you have a lot of high resolve characters, this could be additional wounds. And again, think of wounds as health. So it's saying additional uh, temporary health that you get. Not bad for a tier one. Then we have Master of Command. In the first round of every combat, Rogue Trader and their allies gain uh, rogue, basically uh, two plus Rogue Trader's Iconoclast rank, additional MP, which is movement points. So you can move more at the beginning of combat, position a little more effectively, and get the jump on the enemies. Tier 3 is Courage and Steel. Rogue Trader and their allies need 30 less momentum to activate a heroic act. This is huge. Uh, basically, you need less morale. You're able to proc heroic acts more often. Um, and again, for a tier three, this is probably the best tier three of all, in my opinion, because heroic acts literally make or break your combat a lot of times. And on higher difficulties, procking heroic acts as often as possible is the way of beating really overwhelming odds. Then you have tier four, transcend the potential. Once per battle, the rogue trader may choose an ally. The target ally may immediately use their heroic act without spending momentum. Not applicable to allies whose heroic act is on cooldown. This is important because you can traditionally only use one heroic act per battle, per person. There is an exception uh, for one of the classes. Um, but generally this is very useful because you can utilize this, use a heroic act, and then immediately do another heroic act of another character. So to really double dip, and that could be the difference between wiping out a whole encounter that's why i said this is probably the most powerful singular effect of any of these uh, pathways and then number five excellence any attacks from allies that may hit other allies will be dodged if possible any allied ability that may target an ally and has a resistance test will be resisted by allies basically this game has friendly fire and what it's saying is if you have a weapon ability that could damage somebody they're going to dodge it and resistances is important because if you have to do a resistance test, if you fail that resistance test, you're going to take damage, for example, or a debuff. So this means that 
and this is at any time, which again, super powerful, um, you're going to be immune from any friendly fire. So needless to say, as I mentioned, especially tier four and tier five for Iconoclast, um, the most powerful, I don't know if they did this on purpose because the Iconoclast is the most goody tissue pathway. I don't know if it's just, they're trying to get give you more incentive to uh, play the side. But again, I don't feel like these are as balanced as they could be. These are super, super powerful. Now, do you note, as I mentioned, you can't, you don't have to make just singular decisions. So here, uh, I they have very little bit on Iconoclast, but you'll notice actually I've unlocked tier one benefits from Dogmatic and tier three of the Heretical. The amount of points you need to level this up does increase quite dramatically as you go up in the tiers. Um, so if you really want to max out level five, this is going to, you're going to want to lean into that pathway. I also do want to point out, and again, I, I want to keep the spoilers minimum, but things on your ship, on your void ship, will change dramatically depending which pathway you go. So again, I don't want to spoil it, but there'll be new NPCs, new areas of the ship will transform uh, and have different kind of interactive or for, for flavor and RP purposes items as well. So there is a variety of differences. If you were to just play in the middle and do a little bit of everything, I feel like you would miss out. So my recommendation is pick a pathway and really lean into it. Now, the final thing I want to point out and talk about are companions and their own preferences. So you'll notice outside of Xeno's characters, which don't have a preference currently, everybody else will have a preference to different levels. So Idra is Heretical Tier 2, uh, Cassia is Dogmatic 2, and so forth. You can most definitely have a party of mixed characters. However, here's a big however. There is an, at least one incident that I've run into where uh, if you choose a certain pathway, you will permanently lose a character. You can also just choose if, let's say, you are Dogmatic, and you don't like Xeno's characters, you can talk to one of the NPCs. And, um, and again, I won't spoil it and say, hey, I hate the Xeno trash. Get rid of them. And you can literally remove your characters. So you can lose characters if you want to RP-wise on purpose. With certain exceptions, for the majority of the game, you can, though, have a mixed crew. You, it may seem literally heretical to have dogmatic and heretical people play together, but I have done it. With that being said, if you want to kind of role play and get into it, I could totally see people uh, building a, a team of individuals that have very similar uh, beliefs. Don't forget, you can create custom characters if, again, you really want to lean into this and uh, have a team that's all just one conviction pathway if you don't have the main characters, main companions that kind of meet that need. Because, again... From everything I've found so far through two acts, there's a pretty even representation of dogmatic, heretical, and iconoclasts, except I've only found one heretical so far. So keep that in mind. Hope this has helped you understand the conviction system a little bit better. If you did, make sure to drop a like. Again, subscribe to the channel for more RPG content. Um, and let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. That being said, thank you for all the support, guys. As always, I'll see you guys in the next video.